This entry was again inspired by Bob Rutella's Golf is Not a Game of Perfect, which I know I've recommended in the past and will continue to do so. Anyways, the thought that I wanted to unpack a bit more today was the idea of picking the smallest target possible. And in relation to golf, what this would mean would be not simply trying to hit the ball straight or hit the left side of the fairway, but instead picking out a specific branch of a specific tree amongst a group of trees that's off in the distance. There is extreme practical benefits to this, and we'll discuss more on this later. But what I was struck with is this is information that I already knew and tried to apply to my golf game, but was immediately struck by how relevant it is in other aspects of general life. I'm going to be using the game of golf as an analogy for life. So let's dig into that analogy a little bit more. We can picture life as a golf course with each hole being a particular stage or different aspect of life. Some are going to be longer or comparatively tougher than others. But that being said, the purpose of a game of golf is to finish the round with the least amount of shots possible. Now, you may ask then, what is the purpose of life? And there are certainly those that believe that there is no purpose, life is meaningless. Others would find purpose in the religious beliefs that they grew up with or continue to live out. And I think if you asked a lot of people, if you press them on it, they would admit that there is purpose to life and maybe they've seen or been around people who have found it, but they themselves are struggling to find it themselves. If I may, I'd like to posit an idea that Jordan Peterson has put forward and I happen to agree with. The idea is that it is undeniable that a certain level of suffering is part of life. And perhaps purpose can be found in alleviating the amount of unnecessary suffering that one has to experience in life and by doing so maybe they can alleviate some of that unnecessary suffering in those around them this is a very general aim just like shooting a low score in golf is and that's why it must be broken down into specific holes specific shots within the hole and the specific skills to to pull off each of those given shots. When I stand on the tee of any particular golf hole, I picture how would the hole play out if I hit every shot perfectly. And to do so, I start by starting at the green. I figure out what side of the green I want to hit my shot into. And then I take it a step back of what angle do I want to hit that in from and what distance I hit it from. And from there, I have to figure out which club I'm going to use to get to that distance. I reverse engineer it. Before I even consider that first shot, I'm giving myself a plan. A plan that may be subject to change or a plan that may not go exactly as I planned, but a plan nonetheless. Round to round or day by day, my plan could change significantly on any given hole. Weather conditions, my current confidence level are just a couple of the factors that go into formulating a plan on that particular day. How I approach a certain hole will also differ greatly from how someone else may approach it. For example, my old boss and his son used to play for money every weekend and both of them were scratch golfers. They shot around or under par. Now the son hit the golf ball as far as most touring pros. I was there one day when he decided to fly a golf ball 315 yards in the air over hazard and left himself with a 15 foot putt for Eagle. That's ridiculous. His dad, on the other hand, was about 60 at the time, hit it about 60 yards shorter than his son, but through amazing ball striking and short game wizardry, and even his self-assessed mediocre putting, when you looked at their win-loss record at the end of the year, they were basically even, when it shouldn't have even been close. 
The analogy may be a little on the nose when compared to life, but let's continue to explore it further. Perhaps the hole that we're talking about is finding a line of work or a job that you love. What you have to first do is you figure out a plan, starting with the job that you'd like and you work your way back. You figure out what kind of experience or education do I need to get there? And then you work maybe a step back of finding a job that you can do right now to save enough money to undertake that training. Maybe the first step is simply finding someone who's already doing that job and reaching out, talking to them about it to figure out if it's a job you actually want to pursue. I've spoken recently about comparison to others, and this directly applies to other people who are trying to do the same thing that you're doing. In my case, I'm looking to become a full-time basketball trainer. I have many skills in this discipline that I've developed over the last number of years, but if I were to compare myself to how other people in the industry are doing, it'd be extremely easy for me to get discouraged and to stop pursuing it at all. A former NBA player who is looking to get into skill development will have a set of skills and experiences that I just will never have. My goal of becoming a full-time trainer, however, is not a zero-sum game. Just because someone is further along or has a different set of skills doesn't actually stop me from pursuing and achieving that goal. It may take longer. I may have to work harder and smarter. At the end of the day, I may not ever reach the same status as that former NBA player, but status isn't why I'm pursuing becoming a basketball trainer. I'm looking to impact the lives of as, as many players as I possibly can. My game plan has been rather straightforward when it's come to developing the skills I need to become a basketball trainer. Firstly, I experimented on myself and tried to see if I could get myself to become a little bit better. Then I started working with players of all ages and started to use those same experiments on them. Some things worked and lots of things didn't. Even the things that did work were refined. I got feedback. I could see them played out. I spent time researching the game outside of just the gym. This whole time, I worked for free. I wanted to be confident that I could truly provide value to those players before I wanted to charge or accept any kind of payment for it. And now, after two or three years, I'm starting to feel confident in my ability to do that. During this time, I also reached out to individuals that were already doing what I wanted to do and started the process of building relationships with them. And I used the word relationships intentionally because that was my focus going into those interactions. I've spoken about it before, but it's not the fact that I was unaware that byproducts such as notoriety or clout or perceived competence would come from these interactions. I'm fully aware that they may be byproducts, but they weren't the intention. Meeting and starting relationships with guys like Mike, like Drew, highlight this. Do I understand that there are more recognizable faces than myself in the space and that people may give me more credibility because I associate that with them? I'm aware, but that's not the reason for entering into those relationships. I entered them to learn and to hopefully be able to provide value back to them one day as they've given value to me. Now that I'm at a place where I feel confident that I can provide value to players regardless of age, I'm starting to start to learn the process of building a sustainable brand and how I can look to expand my reach to be able to impact more players and provide more value to all of them. That was a whole lot about game plan, but I think it underlines the importance of at least having a game plan as a framework for you to achieve the most efficient route of success. A golf hole in and of itself is broken down into specific shots. You have to be able to drive the golf ball, 
approach shots, chipping, putting. I have outlined a few of the shots required for me to become a basketball trainer. And a few more may include film study, communication skills, relationship building with players. Obviously there's more, but those are the ones that come to my head quickly. To achieve confidence in any of these skills, they must be practiced both in practice, but also tested in competition. Golf coaches often talk about learning something and taking it from the range to the golf course and from the golf course to a tournament. If we take communication skills, for example, this process might be learning to speak in front of a camera or to yourself in the mirror. Then perhaps speaking to someone who's close to you one-on-one -on -one, so that they'll give you honest feedback but we'll still have your feelings in mind a little bit as well. Then speaking to one player and then a team and perhaps finally a clinic. At each of these stages, you review your progress. And as you start to gain confidence in that, you take the next step outside of your comfort zone. And that's how we produce confidence. When working on a specific shot in golf, if we try to work on too many aspects of that shot, we may end up working a little on all of them and actually getting better at none of them. These would be the micro skills, as Drew would call them, of each shot. And in golf, they could include face angle, base path, tempo. And when deciding what micro skill we're gonna work on, I tend to use Gary Keller's principle from the one thing, which the statement would be, which one thing, if completed, or in this case improved, would make all the rest either unnecessary to work on or a whole lot easier? When it comes to my golf game, the answer is almost always tempo. I digress. There are many micro skills when it comes to communication. It could be eye contact, body language, clarity of speech, tone, content. These are all important, but what you would have to do is you'd have to rank them in order of importance and hammer out that number one thing. Then if need be, re-rank them and do it again. The same thing could apply to golf, could apply to basketball, can, can apply to most any skill that you want to learn. And by working intelligently in this manner, you're gonna start to gain confidence much quicker, which finally brings us to our, our conclusion. In the beginning, I spoke about the idea of picking a picking as small a target as possible. And there are practical reasons behind that. One, if we make a very specific target, we allow ourselves to gain the most accurate feedback possible. In golf, if I happen to pick a branch and miss that branch by 15 yards, I can then make adjustments if I see fit. But if I were to simply want to hit the ball straight, that golf ball could land 40 yards away from an optimal position. The ball potentially traveled straight, mission accomplished, but it didn't end up anywhere near where I wanted it. The second benefit of putting a precise aim on what we desire is the fact that potential roadblocks or hazards don't enter into our vision. I hear golfers say it all the time. I just want to hit it over the water. And in admitting that, they have allowed the hazard to become their area of focus and not their intended target. When that golfer inevitably puts a poor swing on the golf ball and the ball goes splash, I am not surprised one bit. It isn't that we should ignore these hazards. As someone who's hit really great golf shots, 
into hazards that I did not know were there, I can attest to that statement. However, it's when we look at them. When we're in our planning stage, yes, we should be aware of where hazards are, where we cannot go. But as we start to approach that golf ball and we start picking our targets, our intention should be on that specific aim, the thing that we want. And in doing so, the negative aspects, the hazards, as we've been saying, stay away from our field of view. Once we step up to the golf ball and it's time to pull the trigger, well, we have to do as my friend Travis would say, commit.